Well, hello, everybody. Welcome on to a very special episode of Grand Slam KBO on this Thursday evening as we preview the upcoming series between Two Sam Bears and LG Twins at Championship Baseball Stadium in Seoul. All three games will be live on ESPN and Sport TV this weekend. So it's a perfect opportunity to view one of the best sporting rivalries in South Korea. My name is Andrew Farrell, and unfortunately, I'm on my own today because Matthew, Brad, and Bradley are all unavailable, but they will be back for the regular Sunday night slot. I do have two very special guests on today's show, though. Up first is MikeKBO.net founder, Danny Kurtz. And Danny's going to be telling us about his experiences of visiting Jamshop for the first time 20 years ago. And the second part of the show, we'll have renowned artist Andy Brown on to talk about painting Major League Baseball ballparks and also where it all began for him when it comes to painting ballparks. And that was here in South Korea. You can follow our show at Grand Slam KBO or at Chimek Baseball. And you can email us at grandsamkbo.com. Before we go any further, though, I just want to say a big thank you to Soul Based, uh, uh, sorry, Soul Based Band uh, Cicada State. A few of their members have now since moved on, but um, they have given us the, the use of their song, Cuddy Sark, which is the introduction and the outro of our podcast. We will be playing a lot more of their music throughout the year. So if you're in a band and you'd like us to play some of your music, don't hesitate to get in touch at Grand Sam KBO or at Chimek Baseball. You can send us an email and we'd be delighted to play your music here. Okay, so up first is Danny Kurtz the founder of MyKBO.net, and he begins by talking about how life has changed dramatically for him ever since the KBO moved to ESPN. Yeah, I, it's actually not by choice, honestly. Well, I guess it is because I respond to the emails. But yes, I, I did get a lot of emails and a lot of um, you know requests in the first couple of weeks once the season got underway, and it was overwhelming. It was like, it still is, like the fact that people want to talk about the KBO here in North America. It just blows my mind. And it's, it's, it's as a fan, it's been awesome because I've been so excited to talk about the league that I've been following for so long. It, it, but it's still just mind, mind blowing. The fact that it's on ESPN, the fact that major newspaper outlets are like, just, they're just trying to find anybody to talk to about the KBO. And as you, as you all know, the, the English, community of KBO fans is very small. I mean, <laughs> we pretty much know everybody and anybody that's been in it prior to this year yeah, because of the small communities, which has been awesome, which has been great. But now it's, it's also so exciting to see how big and how much further that, that, that community is going to expand now after all this exposure. Yeah, so we have you on the show today to talk about um, this Dusan versus LG rivalry, which is on this weekend in Jamshul Stadium, which is beautifully placed behind you there. Um, these games are all going to be on ESPN this weekend. Before we get on to that, just quickly on to the actual coverage of itself. You said that, you know, you're, just, you're so happy to be talking about KBO to so many new fans. And stuff. How did you find doing commentary for ESPN yourself? How did you find being the guy with the microphone talking about baseball? It was nerve wracking. It was the most nervous. So like when I had to go on, like I did, I started my website 20 years ago or, you know, less than a little less than 20 years ago. I never expected it to grow and then turn into an appearance on, you know, ESPN. So when they, obviously I grew up watching that. And when they asked, I was like, are you serious? You want me, you want me on? Why? It's, it's so then I had to show up. I think I had to go on at like 3 a.m. my time, Pacific time, where I am in the United States. And I couldn't sleep the whole, both appearances. I was really nervous. I was like, I, I don't know what's going on. I was like, I don't know what they're going to ask me. Are they going to do this? They gave me some possible questions. I had it all all written out. I had so many notes. I had like, here, notes basically look like this because now I got, oh, sorry, the screen's not showing. <laughs> my, the screen's not showing. It's the sheets of paper with notes on. And that's how I now prepare for for like these media it's and so when I had that I was like oh let's be prepared so I was overly prepared and the, the, one of the games was an LG game and so I was like had all these facts and random factoids and then like the questions they asked weren't anything about that so I was like man <laughs> I spent like two hours prepping for that <laughs> but then at the end of the day they asked some questions I, I was able to talk and like I said it was amazing opportunity a dream come true never thought it would you know happen again i don't know if it's going to happen again in the future if it doesn't great 
I get to sleep. If it does, great. That would be cool. You know, I could go on again, but it's not something that I was striving for, but it was just, you know, like icing on the cake for this 2020, you know, KBO season. Yeah. Yeah. It was great. I mean, it was so popular, obviously, as you said, like on the My KBO Facebook site, especially, you would have known a lot of the same people for years. Like a lot of us have been going back there for a long, long time. It was a small community. We had, we even went to games. It was that the great game we went to back in 2015, I think it was, this, this My KBO day out. But Still got the scar for that one. Got the scar. Yeah, yeah. The picture, yeah. was it was yourself or it might have been Harry Dean. Somebody put up the photograph from the, uh, the, the, the Tigers, the third base cheerleading stand after the game. Yeah, that it was blurry in that. I mean, that was probably a good representation of that night. It was it was a very blurry picture, and so all I you know all I remember is hitting the dugout with my shin, and then a couple of weeks later having to go get the shin drained because of fluid buildup. <laughs> but at the time, it was a wonderful time. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So I encourage everybody. I think with your post in the my KBO community, you said everybody's going out. It's supposed to be going out to Mule Yak. Mm-hmm. And then going to Nogari, yeah. right, on yeah. July 4th. So I can't be there in person. So I hope everybody that goes out there is able to drink mass amounts of adult beverages of your choice, whether that is Budweiser, which I think is 7,000 won. That's, a, that's about 4,000 won more than I'd be paying for a Budweiser. So I'd probably go with whatever else they have on tap, probably whatever their Seng Mekchu is. Yeah. The Seng Mekchu was, I can't remember if it was OB or Kass, but I will definitely be going with the Seng Mekchu. The, the local pint is by far the best. I think it was either three, five, or 4,000 won for the local beer. And then a few plates of chicken, hopefully, as well, to go around. They have 10 TVs. There are five TVs in front of you and then five TVs behind you. And there's just so much to watch. And that, that the bar has big windows either side as well. And of course, they're all open. The wet, it's hot as hell here these days. So and air con is pumping while the doors are open or whatever. But just everything is perfect to watch baseball. Well, now in these times with no fans in the stands, it's probably about the best you can get. So anybody that's watching, go on out there, go to Grand Slams day out, represent Grand Slam, represent Mike ABO, get, you know, get drink enough that your pictures turn out blurry as well. But don't trip. Crucially, don't, don't trip. <laughs> don't, don't hurt your shin on a table or anything there. Um, let's, Backtrack, backtrack a good bit here. So I noticed on, we had a slight chat about it on, on Twitter today. You were mentioning the 2002 World Cup that you were in Korea for as well um, and how unbelievable the fan experience was. Then Korea made it all the way as far as the semifinals of that World Cup. When did you first start going to baseball games in Korea? Uh, my first baseball game would have been the fall of 2000, and that was a Doosan game. And because of the adult beverages, I couldn't tell you who Doosan was playing. All I remember is that it was the Doosan Bears and a player by the name of Tyrone Woods, who was a Doosan Bears legend, hit a monster home run. And ever since then, I've been hooked on the league. Yeah. But um, that would have been my first game experience. And so since then, I've been trying to find out more about the league every day and still am. Yeah, and that obviously was in Jamshil. So, I mean, there's a picture of Jamshil behind you there. Even in my, I've been in Korea for about 10 years now, but that stadium has changed a lot. Um, interestingly, of course, it's the home of two different teams, like an Italian soccer type thing. You've got the LG Twins and Tucson Bears who share this ballpark, which is so rare, so unique, and it just adds to this, this great rivalry that they have. Presumably that's why ESPN want to show three games, all three games in the series. But how much has that ballpark behind you changed in terms of prices? Because as we were saying just before we came on, you can get a liter of beer for 4000 about $4. Tickets are still really cheap. But I'd imagine when you were going, like whatever, maybe 20 years ago at this point, it must have been a lot different. Yes, the old man that I am. So back in my day, the beer was five cents. Uh, no, but the, it, honestly, though, all the prices were representative of what was out in the community. So that's what I loved about the going to KBO games, whether whatever stadium I went to, because I, I, I visited down in Suwon before the KT Wiz were there. I, I got to see Hyundai Unicorns play. I called that I called that stadium the library because literally it was so quiet. No people were there. They were they were winning championship after championship and no fans came out. So like the KT fans have actually proved me wrong because I'm actually surprised. You know, I was like when they came into the league, I was like, nobody's gonna go. They they did this with this, you know, Hyundai Unicorns. But then KT's actually like doing really actually pretty well for fans and then actually pretty 
pretty cool things like a water slide in the outfield. I don't, I don't know how safe it is, but you know, you got a water slide, at least it looks cool. But for, for me, when I was at Chump Show, the one thing that's changed since then is obviously the different, they've improved their seating. Mm -hmm. They, I just saw like the picture that's behind me right now, the green outfield seats have now been upgraded to actually have real seats and backs. Um, the one thing that was disappointing since uh, like you guys even know, like you can't walk around the stadium anymore because they had gates. So like that also blew my mind because I would buy an outfield seat and then I could literally walk to the infield and then go down and sit down in a seat if I wanted to. But yeah. they, have, they have since then blocked that access off because people like me probably abused it. I, I honestly did. And I, once I sat in the outfield, I'd stay in the outfield. Um, but yeah, the, the, the experience is still pretty much the same though. I mean, they, they tried to make things a little prettier, but when you have like an old 1980s concrete, stadiums like that you can only do so much to make it look aesthetically better but yeah. it still looks better to me than like probably the Kojak Sky Dome. <laughs> right, right. Right. I think a lot of people would agree with you but that that trip your first time there was before the 2008 Olympic gold winning team from from Beijing and a lot of people say that changed the popularity of baseball in Korea at the time so when you were going you were saying that the uh, Hyundai Unicorns games were like a library what like now you see at a green baseball game, it's full of children, it's full of men and women, couples, everybody's going. Whereas the old photographs seem to be a lot of like absolutely hammered older dudes at the games. Was that a bit like your early experience? Yes, I well, wasn't older, but I might have been one of the hammered dudes. But yes, it was a lot of um, older men, yeah. Ajishis, and yeah. that they went out to the games. Um, and at that time, like now, we look. And you're like, wow, you know, most of the most of the fans that go to games, that at least when you watch it on TV, they are female. Like the the the, it's a fifty fifty, maybe even sixty forty split. If you were to watch, at least from what it is, from what I'm saying, which is which is incredible, the way that the fan demographics works like that. Um, I know Major League Baseball wishes they could have that kind of demographic, like the female fan represented that strongly in in their attendance. Yeah. Um, but back then it was definitely not the fan the attendance was way less and it was um it was still loud but the attendance was not quite the same as what it is now and like you said 2008 the wbc the gold the gold medal at the 2008 olympics just boom the the attendance just skyrocketed yeah yeah i'd love to have i mean the first game i ever went to was in 2009 even like baseball feels a lot different in 2009 than it does in 20 well 2019 the last time we went to a game but 2000 seems pretty wonderful um i'd love to have loved to have seen that at some point um so then Dusan and LG as a rivalry these two teams sharing that same stadium do you remember going to see some of those games before oh yes i remember i i purposely try to go see those games because it's it's a built-in rivalry i mean you don't have to it, it, whether it was forced or not it, it's built in because they share the same stadium so it's kind of like in basketball terms the clippers and the lakers when they were sharing the same in for basketball here in the nba but it's like they share the city of seoul now with kiwum there now there's three teams so i think in a lot of times with all these media appearances, people are asking like, what is the MLB comparison to so-and-so? What, you know, so I always want to know the major league baseball team. And I always hated doing that. But honestly, the one team that I said that was very similar to like a major league baseball team would be the LG twins are very similar to the New York Mets. And the only reason I said it is because New York's a large city. Seoul is a very large city. New York, New York Mets split their split their city. They have to share it with the New York Yankees and other sports teams. The LG Twins have to share it with the Doosan Bears and the Kiwom Heroes and many other and the other sports teams, you know, from the other sports. Um, and at least with the New York Mets, they always have generally they would always have high expectations, but then never, <laughs> never follow through with them on the field. LG always they have a strong they have a strong fan base. Uh, they have a very strong fan base. And their teachers hasn't won the, the won the title in how many years? 1992, I think. Yeah. 92 or 94. Yeah. Either way, it's a long time ago. I was a teenager then. So it's been a long time. And just by the, you know, there's eight teams in the league for a while. And now it's jumped up to 10. But just by mathematically speaking, in those 20-some years. But yeah. it hasn't. So that's why I made the comparison to the Mets. Um, Disclaimer, I'm a Deuce on Bears fan because that was the first game I went to. So, yes, 
I would, you know, but now I just, I try to, you know, root for all teams, take, try to take, you know, stay local, but yes, at heart, I am a Doosan Bears fan. So this upcoming series is going to be great because it's the sec- currently second and third place teams going at it. Um, it's a little early to start talking playoffs, but it is fun, you know, to, when these two teams are both good, it is, it, it's a mix of rivalry that much more fun. Can I share something with you here? Because um, it was actually yours. You posted this on my KBO um, last week. And it was this rivalry, um, what the fans make of this, this rivalry. Oh, yeah. Are you able to see this here? Yes, yes, I am. Um, so the thing that stands out most here, of course, is Dusan Bears fans, whoever number was polled out of these 10,499 fans, 70% of whatever number of Doosan fans it was, said that SK, SK Wyverns were the biggest rivals. And only 15% chose the LG Twins, whereas you look at LG Twins, and it's 69.7% for Doosan. Was this information surprising to you? Yes and no. So as, a, as somebody who's followed Doosan for the last 20 years, in the late 2000s, um, early 2010s, SK was dominant. Mm-hmm. And Doosan and SK had some incredible Korean series battles. I mean, benches, like they had takeout slides, they had benches clearing. And so it was, it was a fun rivalry. And so I think that is where that maybe have, have came from, because I don't know where the, I don't know the age of the 10,499 fans. It didn't give the demographics of them. So maybe they're thinking back to that. It also maybe goes to show um, sorry, LG fans, but maybe just the dominance that Doosan has had over LG. Um, I think they're, I think LG has like a 400 winning percentage against Doosan and the head-to-head in, in their historical matchups, maybe a little more. Um, basically, Doosan's dominated them year after year in, in their rivalry series. And so maybe Doosan fans, after winning so many titles recently, they're just like... LG is not even not even on our radar. That's why then they go with the Kiwum heroes who have been very good. I mean, to have Kiwum, yeah. you know, there is was surprising. But it kind of makes sense because these fans are probably just looking back over the last couple of years then when they say like Kiwum or something like that. But SK would then harken back, I'd say, at least like I said, to the late 2000s, early 2010s when they had Doosan and SK had some really fun Korean series. Yeah. Yeah, I find it. I find it really surprising. There's a great um, documentary series on YouTube from this company called Copa Ninety. It's a football one, soccer one. They do derbies around Europe, and like a lot of the biggest derbies in European soccer might be from two teams in the same city, like Barcelona and Real Madrid, sure. or Liverpool and Manchester United. But for me, even and I, like I'd be more of a neutral in terms of this particular one, but. My, if, if they were coming over here to do a baseball documentary, I would have just presumed that LG Doosan would be the most obvious one for an outside broadcaster to do if they wanted to show Korean baseball and show the biggest rivalry in this in this country. What do you think? Do you think I'm, I would be mistaken in that? Yeah, I mean, it, I don't think you are just simply because, like you said, it is because of their, they share the same city, they share the same um, stadium. So that just in itself makes it a rivalry. So... Th- I, I do know that in recent years, some other teams have gone up in rivalries. But then you have some of the old historic teams, too, the, the original six teams that have some really good, um, not just because of baseball, but regional rivalries that yeah. come out. So like you as a Kia Tigers fan down in Gwangju, you know, they have, they have their own rivals going on with the other provinces yeah, and yeah. the other teams from that. But just from like – if you're ESPN and you're presented with, you know, you got a chance to show the two top three teams for this weekend. They happen to play in the same stadium and they have both are both have very well-known players. They have, you know, Ramos, who is, you know, very popular right now in, in the ESPN side. Um, they have, you know, Doosan, who's won what? They've gone to the Korean series six years out of the last seven and won it three times so i mean yeah. it's not it's gonna make for some good it's gonna make for some good tv and that's why probably espn latched onto that series again for those that don't know espn is only presented two broadcasts two two broadcasts each day to choose from or each 
day of the week because they, they only receive the SPO TV and SPO TV two feeds. So ESPN has to go through and whichever one that SPO TV has is all they're able to choose from. So I would say Deuce on LG is probably the best bet for that whatever game. I don't even know who's on SPO TV two this coming week, but that, that's probably obviously the, the number one game for SPO TV as well. Yeah, it probably makes sense anyway to show this game. There's so many games throughout the, the entire season. I'm not sure too many people will complain, even if they did have a greater choice of or greater access to games, given, as you said, that these two teams are second and third in the table. Um, we might as well just bring that up as well. This is from your site, of course. This is from uh, mykbo.net. So it adds a huge amount to this, knowing that these two sides are both at the top of the table, and the Twins especially are in... I can, you know, seemingly like in a good amount of form right now. Doosan are struggling a bit more. Um, so it definitely makes it a lot more exciting. Um, now, the one thing I want to ask you about, though, because it's interesting that LG Twins are the home team in this three-game series against Doosan Bears, but Doosan's clubhouse is on the first base side. Isn't that right? And yes. LG's is on the third base side. But because LG are playing at home, they'll have to actually cross over each other after the game yes to to go in you mean to like literally walk into their dressing yeah room? Yes. that yes it's really it's, it's just so bizarre to see that that you know even though at the end of the game Dusan will be in the um Dusan are sorry yeah, lg are in the uh the first base dugout because they're the home team this weekend but their clubhouse is actually behind third base sure i mean it's 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 i mean it's not that far a trip, but yeah, I guess, I mean, it's probably odd for some of the guys, but yeah, I mean, it's, it, it's always interesting little stuff like that that comes out in this rivalry. And again, that's why it's basically a built in rivalry because they share the same stadium. They share the same city. And that's why if the fans were there, this is what makes, this is to me, what makes, makes this a great rivalry. Like it's always, it's all every children's day. It's the game to, to watch because the fans pack it in there. The kids are there and it's just, it's just a fun. I, every time I live in Korea, I've, I've lived in Seoul, except for one summer I lived down in Jinhae. So obviously my bias is probably towards the Deuce on LG series versus any other rivalry, just because it's, it's, it's a fun one to me as a fan, as a Deuce on fan, but also just as a fan of the KBO, because like you said, it's pitting two of the biggest cities teams against each other. And Generally, Doosan has been very dominant, but this year currently with the LG doing as well as they are. And what's the scary part about LG is Tyler Wilson and Casey Kelly are not at their peak yet. Yeah. Um, we've all seen what they can do. So uh, if they can get it, you know, to what they were last year, oh my goodness. I mean, LG, LG going for it first over NC. I mean, if they can get it together, if the Ramos can stay healthy, it's going to be really fun to see how far they can, they can go. And, and I'll just give myself a pat on the back because I actually had LG doing, doing decently this year, because it's like, like I said, they're kind of like the Mets and they always have high expectations, but then usually on field, they never, it never comes to fruition. So it's been nice to see that they, this early season, they've been able to put it together and have some, have some good luck here uh, for, for them as a team. Yeah, you mentioned earlier on as well that um, Doosan have kind of lorded over um, the LG Twins for a long time. What was it two seasons ago where it, did they only drop one game against the Twins? Yeah, in in in, in recent in recent years, I don't have my I had my ESPN notes about that actually uh, <laughs> out earlier. I, I I lost them here, but in, in the in the recent years, Doosan has just straight dominated. Yeah, dominated them just like again in in LG's defense, you could just say Doosan's dominate the league obviously it showing by how many titles they've had or how many times they've been in the Korean series but uh going into this rivalry yes Doosan has taken an LG to the woodshed <laughs> <laughs> right right so what I was going to ask you is this a series that I know there's a long way to go and LG are it's really hard to imagine LG not making the playoff anyway but given the recent form of the last number of years against the Bears it is a home series for them the Bears are struggling these days. LG, it's hard to imagine them really playing any better than they currently are. Is this a series that they really have to win so they can kind of prove to themselves that maybe they do have a chance of going far this season? Or if they keep losing these big series to Doosan, is it just are they just going to be an also-run when it comes to the playoffs? 
you hit well, what you were saying earlier. You hit it. This is a huge series. Like you said, it's only June 18th, 19th. You know, it's still early in the season, but this is a big series for the LG Twins. Not so much for Doosan as much, but this is to say, hey, we can take the best of the best. And not only that, they can create separation between them and Doosan. If they were if they were to go for a series sweep, which would be incredible for them and as, as a team, they'd be able to create a lot of distance between themselves and Tucson. It'd give them some confidence, uh, and they'd be. I think at this point, the way they're playing, they're winning. They don't have Ramos in the lineup yet. Um, they're winning without their slugger right now. Um, you put him back in the lineup. Like I said, if Kelly and Wilson start throwing like they threw last year, you know, they, it, it, it's I. They could become a very scary team, and then. If fans get let in for the playoffs, and that's what I'm telling all these new KBO fans, um, whether all, you know, Premier League soccer's opened up, Major League Baseball might be coming back. So, yes, you might start watching other sports, but come back in October and November when KBO playoffs are here because you think KF, you think playoff, you know, games are unpredictable unpredictable now wait till you watch a playoff game and then you have hopefully the crowd there because it's just insane and that's what I love about KBO playoff baseball and I think the two teams we're talking about will definitely be in the playoffs yeah. but LG might I mean if they continue the run that they're having they could be pushing NC right now for for the top spot sure sure um, I agree with you like the other thing is we all have videos or photos that we've taken of games in the past where we could just upload those onto social media there are already a lot of them up there anyway um, for people to see but I think it's you know to give them a flavor of what it's like to watch baseball in Korea but it would just mean a lot more if we were able to go to games now and then these like the current photographs of the current videos and ones that we're able to upload and a lot of new fans will be able to uh, really enjoy what the, what KBO is all about um, especially I still think I'm, I'm really biased on this even though my team doesn't play in that stadium behind you but that is as good as it gets as far as I'm concerned for atmosphere and game day experience in Korea is that beautiful picture that you said that you took right behind. Oh, I, I, I did take this, and obviously, you can see it's not sold out. Yeah, this game is actually underway and it's not sold out. This is a midweek game just yeah. from 2014 or 2015, and this is actually pretty. This is pretty normal what a attendance looks like during the midweek games until later in the game. Um, but yeah, it, it for the fans that don't know that amount of fans can be incredibly loud. This is why I'm not sitting down by the cheering section. This is why I'm at the top of the stadium because even those few of fans, those little bit of few thousands of fans will hurt my eardrums. And I'll be like, I can't have the headache. The The music mixed in with like multiple liters of height just don't go well together for my head. But if that's what you like, this is, it's an incredible atmosphere. But yes, it, watching a game at Champ Show is one of my favorite things to do just because I think it's, it's in the center of the city. Well, not directly in the center, um, but like it's, it, it's, it, it's in the middle of a large city. It's yeah. still outside. I'm not a big fan of domes. If Chamshell ever did get upgraded, I'd go for something. I'm based in here in Washington state, Safeco field where the Mariners play or now it's T-Mobile field. Sorry. They basically have a retractable roof, but it's basically like an umbrella. It's not air conditioned. It still can have the the same air outside but it's just whenever there's rain it just there's a little umbrella that comes over top and then as soon as the rain goes they just pull it back and yeah. and they're ready to go and they don't have to worry about the air conditioning they just use the elements of the outside but it's a great thing and i mean if champ shell doesn't go full dome which i kind of hope they don't i yeah. if they were to ever think of it i hope they go with at least like a, a retractable roof like that so that you get the elements and you get you know <laughs> get to save yourself during the cold months and you know the rainy months yeah, yeah, I agree. And especially the view behind you, like over the stand, because if you're on the third base side and you see the Gangnam Sky lit up after, like during a game, and you know, you keep bringing up the, the adult beverages is there as well. The adult beverages sometimes makes you forget about, especially if your team is losing badly, it makes you forget about what's on the field in front of you. And you can just admire this insane beauty, this great ballpark, an old ballpark by Korean standards, and then a you know, great skyline, great view in the background. It, it doesn't get any better than that. As far as well, I'm yeah, and, and we actually talked about this before we came before we jumped on the interview about like just tearing down history. So I'm still upset that Seoul, the city of Seoul, tore down Tongdemun Stadium, mm -hmm. which is the one of the original stadiums for especially for the league playing. That that is baseball history right there. They went and tore it down and put the DDP Museum or art gallery, whatever mm -hmm. it is. I went to it a couple times and it was very sterile feeling, and I'm just like. 
you couldn't have put this anywhere else, like in, in, in Korea, you couldn't put this right next to the Goljuk Dome because you guys look the same. Like, I mean, so it was very sad to see. So I know Chamsho is an aging stadium. You can only upgrade concrete so much, <laughs> but like, I hope whatever they do put in there will stay in that same area and it will generally take on that form. Um, you know, put something like an NC's ballpark right there next to the river, right there next to the water. I mean, right the skyline with the water. I mean, it's a great location and we're probably biased because we go to it so often. So, yeah. you know, if, if you don't like our opinions, just email Andrew there and he will defend it or he will argue with you back and forth. But I, I am also a big fan of Chomshell Stadium. Not the most aesthetically pleasing, but a very fun entertainment, um, entertaining place to watch a game. Exactly. Yeah, I don't think it matters how the stadium looks. It's always a, it's always a great time. The Dong Di Moon Stadium that you bring up, and the floodlights are still there. I'm, I'm glad that at least they left that. It yes, that was, was horrendous. Like, yeah, cut everything. Yeah, I mean, you, I was like, great. You left the lights, but you put this monstrosity. Yeah. Sorry, art lovers, contemporary art lovers. It's not for me. Um, again, the Kojak Sky Dome's not for me the way that it looks either. But it's just very sterile, and I'm like. That is history right there. So just, you know, if Chomshell gets upgraded, hopefully they keep something from, from this stadium because it's been around for the Olympics. It's been around for the, um, the expansion of the KBO to see, like, they just think the influx of fans that have now started to watch the league and now 2020, the influx of fans from around the world, which is just amazing. Yeah. Um, before I let you go, Danny, um, we'll have you on the show again. Like we can, we can talk about all these things again and different things. Talk about you know baseball outside of Seoul, sure. baseball in um, back in the early two thousands, whatever. But in terms of this season, <laughs> quickly, LG Dusan, who do you think is going to finish higher up the table when the regular season is done? Oh, I I got to go look back at my predictions. No, I'm just joking. I have because I actually have the QM Heroes winning winning it all, okay. um, beating beating the Doosan Bears. So I actually have Doosan finishing just ahead of LG here um, in the regular season standing. That's just my preseason predictions. But right now, honestly, the way that it's going, if L, like I said, all those players for LG start clicking, their foreign trio starts clicking, um, especially with, on the pitching side, yeah. they could be a very dangerous team. And I think this series right now coming up, the Doosan series is a very big series for the Twins team. Um, not with like a lot of pressure, but I think it's just kind of like you said, to prove to themselves that, hey, we, we, can, we can do this. We got this team. We can beat Doosan this year. It, you know, this is our year. Let's go for it. Nice. Hopefully, um, it would be great. Hopefully, that sounds harsh. But yeah, it would be great if, um, if LG were able to topple the Bears this weekend and kind of look, I guess, look like a real force in this league. Um, finally, they've made the playoffs a lot in the last number of years, but... Great. They, they emerge as like a genuine title contender. There's no doubt the league, the league needs that. And I think like a lot of the fans on your, on, on your site are probably talking to you on Twitter as well. We're, we're wondering who to follow. Um, I would have always thought that a team like LG would be great for that. It's a good team, a huge fan base, but they don't have a lot of success. And can you imagine being there or out in the streets of Jamshill um, on a night when LG end that really long run for a championship? Oh. Be oh, whether whether fans are at the stadium, are allowed at the stadium or not, if LG say won a dramatic game seven, kind of like your Kia Tigers with the, with a home run or something, <laughs> um, can you imagine that whole area of Chamsha that with the LG fans just going in, just going insane? So, like like, like I said, I'm a Doosan fan, but like I also root for all nine other teams just for putting on a good show. When when teams such as LG, Lotte. Samsung, Hanwha, especially Hanwha and Lotte, when they're good and LG, it makes the league more fun. Right, right, right. Um, not just on the field, but obviously fan atmosphere as well, because all those teams travel well with fans. And like I said, for the rivalry specifically with Doosan, you got, if, you know, to, after a while, after getting beat so many times, probably the fans, you know, they still show up, but it's not, it's not going to be is you know it's not as fun for them knowing that hey we haven't won a game yet this year or something against Tucson. this so this series is huge if they can imagine if they can sweep them if they sweep the bears they're going to be feeling really good and they're not that it's going to be you know they're going to be thinking about making a real good postseason run there they will i, I brought this i forgot to show it to you um now i'm not i'm not a Tucson fan as you know but i found this in my drawer this morning Yes, I have 
somewhere hanging up somewhere in my my closet here because i'm recording from my closet um i have it also <laughs> a big boy chejun suck Doosan jersey i actually bought that off of ebay one one year because i was like i need one. Oh, you got him to sign it and everything now, i didn't you know the funny i got this off somebody who's now out of korea and it's because i'm not a Doosan fan and this thing is massive this could be this could be a tent it's absolutely huge but i uh, i only i only actually noticed honestly that it signs like today i have a signed trade inside uniform in my apartment and i actually didn't know it well you can use it to block the sun um <laughs> i love that guy i miss that guy he made he made baseball games fun uh park suck man for nc has now taken his place and now even david buchanan for samsung it's so it's really fun despite fans not being in the stands it's still fun watching um this is why i always love watching the kbo is they put on a show. They're entertainers. They yeah. they like to have a good time. They're not. They don't take themselves. They take they take themselves seriously because they're pro athletes. But they don't take them yet that seriously. So like when the TV cameras are on them during the game, they'll still do funny stuff. Whereas in Major League Baseball, you know, they're like, if I do something funny to the camera, for the most part, you know, fans are gonna get on me, or I'm gonna hear, you know, like, why aren't you focusing on the game? Why aren't you, you know, KBO? It's kind of like Park Suckman just being Park Suckman or something. And so it's just it's just kind of fun stuff. It is. It is great. I'm, uh, I'm badly missing it now. Every time we have these conversations, I'm always dying to go back to a game. But we're, st we're stuck watching a TV for now. Uh, hopefully, hopefully sometime soon we can go back and watch a game. And that will be it. You know? um, it will be incredible. Well, hopefully, yeah, for everybody that's based in Korea and even for those outside of Korea, you guys will get the fans back in. Everybody will be able to watch a game with the KBO, what we call the KBO atmosphere. Um, and then, who knows, next year, fans from outside of Korea are going to be like, I want, I need to get on that plane. I need to go to see a game at Champsha. I need to go see the LG Twins take on the Doosan Bears for, yeah. for a rivalry game. So, I mean, it, it's that good. I encourage everybody to jump on a plane whenever you can and go watch a game. Yeah. They, want, they might want that LG Twins uh, Championship 2020 uniform whenever it comes out. <laughs> if it comes out, we'll see. <laughs> this is a this is a big test. It is, it is. Uh, Danny, thanks so much for giving us so much of your time. It's pretty late over there. Are you going to stay up? to watch the games like this midweek um they're obviously around the middle of the middle of the night for you do you think you'll be especially the friday night game in jam do you think you'll stay up and watch that one? Oh, the 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 ones that start at five o'clock p.m korean time or 1 a.m over here so i can i can hang it depends again how many adult beverages i've had earlier in the evening um <laughs> that happened last weekend I, I fell asleep and then i woke up i'm like game's over what happened um <laughs> <laughs> so the games are on on at like 1 and 2 a.m over here so it's a little harder for me to stay up um not as young as i used to be and i got three kids running around in the morning so it makes it a little tougher but right now it's currently 1 21 a.m my time i may stay up to watch like an inning or two yeah at 2 at 2 30 a.m my time but you won't be able to stay up the whole game Right on. Listen, Danny, thanks so much for giving us so much of your time. And we'll definitely have you on the show again, hopefully. And uh, yeah, we can talk in broader sense about KBO and, and everything else. Most definitely. Thank you for having me on. And a big thank you again to my KBO.net founder, Danny Kurtz, for uh, sharing with us some of uh, his experiences of watching baseball here in South Korea. If you haven't already done so, you should definitely check out the Facebook page, my KBO. There's a good community there of people who like to watch baseball here in South Korea. Moving straight on, uh, up next is Andy Brown, who has painted a lot of ballparks, um, over 100, I think he said, or just shy of 100, in um, North America, Cuba, Mexico, Taiwan, Japan, and here in South Korea. It was actually in Korea where it all began for him when it uh, came to painting ballparks. But Andy began by talking about uh, the amount of traveling he's done since the last time he was on our podcast, which was two years ago. Absolutely. So I, well, as you know, Andrew, I started off in Korea painting the KBO. Um, I learned about baseball in, in Korea. I didn't know about baseball before I was living in Korea. And then in that time I was living in Asia, I traveled to Japan, uh, Taiwan, uh, China, uh, and then I started making trips over to the US during my holidays, during my vacations. And then last year I finished, I quit my teaching. I've been living in Korea for 10 years, so I quit teaching. And then I started painting all the MLB stadiums. So I went from the West Coast to the East Coast, painted all 30 ballparks during a game. I set up with a big easel and a big canvas and I was painting the ballparks and the games as they happened. 
And then after I fit, I went all around the States, finished off in Cooperstown. And then I went down to Mexico, spent about a month in Cuba. And I was painting the baseball and all the, the fun and activities and, and good stuff down there as well. <laughs> okay. There's, I mean, this is so much to get into. I'd love to, we could probably just do a podcast someday of, of just Andy Brown and what he's been up to for the last couple of years. Um, <laughs> And I know you're a busy man. There's so much stuff you want to get done at the moment, and you've got a few other projects um, lined up that you're that you're you know you're starting at the moment. You're hoping to get started soon enough. But I just the American stuff is amazing, and I think the fact that you're English as well um, it makes it more interesting. I think for a lot of people who are living in the states, that there is this guy who goes around said with his weasel, and he's and he's painting all these ballparks. But the Cuba and the Mexico stuff just just really stands out. Like. Um, what was that experience like? Of yeah, Cuba, Cuba and Mexico were special, really special. Latin America, the baseball is, you know, wild. It's, it's the, you see the craziest things in the stadiums, outside the stadiums. It really, you know, that's what I think about kind of why I started painting baseball was it was, I feel like you can really see the culture of the people um, wherever, you, wherever you are through sport. I feel like that's when people loosen up or they, they really like express themselves. And in Cuba and Mexico, there's, they certainly let it all, let it all hang out. Um, it's just, just incredible, incredible stuff. You know, there was, there was like the, the stadiums in Havana and like, you know, too many people in one stadium, just people pushing in to get into the stadium and gates being broken down. And um, in, in Havana as well, some guy using a ladder to get out of the stadium because I don't know why. And then he came back about five minutes later on the ladder. He came back in that way. Um, so it was just wild, wild stuff, but it was, um, but the atmosphere, the, the excitement, the, the fans, the style of baseball, um, it's really varied and it's, it's fantastic over there, but it, you know, it's, it's, it's like everywhere. It's, it's, you know, and Korea's got its, uh, it's great bits and Japan's got its own way of playing it. And the ballparks are completely different in these places as well. And, um, yeah, I found them just, just magical places, magical people and, um, and a lot of fun, just amazing. So just briefly talk us through, like, what's a, the regular baseball game like in Cuba or Mexico? I guess you could pick one or, or both of them. Because, you know, you know, in Korea, if you're going to Jamshil, there's a couple of great pictures of, a couple of great paintings of Jamshil behind you there. You turn up, you leave exit five or exit six at Jamshil Baseball Stadium. There's just throngs of people outside the stadium there queuing up to buy tickets. People are eating gimbap or sometimes dried squid or fried chicken, drinking beer. And, you know, all the jerseys are obviously in Hangul at the back with the names, but the English word for the team name in the front. What's it like outside a ballpark in Mexico and, and Cuba? Yeah, um, it's different. I mean, it's very different. Very, very different. In, in Cuba, the, the stadiums are, I guess, not as well cared for, ultimately. Yeah. Um, so they're a little, you know, the grass is longer inside when you get in there. And outside, you just have like, there'll be a big pig, pig on a spit being roasted. There'll be a pina colada stand over there. Um, there's a big party just going on outside. And then you get inside. And, and, and when I was in Cuba, it was for the playoffs and the, the Winter Series playoffs. And the crowds were just insane. Like, I've never seen crowds like that in a ballpark. And I remember one of the places in Camelway, which is kind of like down the south, kind of down the south of Cuba. And I got to the ballpark. I went very early in the morning just to see what the deal was for the day because I didn't, I didn't really understand what was going on. And then it was about six hours before the, the game started, the, the gates opened, and there was just thousands of people trying to get into the gate, thousands and thousands and thousands. So I managed to get in, and, but then you can't, that's it, you're in, and you've got to stay there. And there was six hours before the game started. So, I mean, luckily I had my, my sketchbook, so I thought, okay, well, I'll get some painting done. But, yeah. you know, there's a lot of just standing around and people just sitting there and, but, it was just amazing, just just unbelievable. And in Mexico, um, again, I mean, it's it, it's it's very different to that. It's it's um, there's a lot of music going on outside. Um, yeah, I mean, there's a lot of dancing, a lot of you know, a lot of like really really like fun, just fun stuff going on outside, and people having a really really good time. Um, but they're both unbelievable places to watch baseball. Unbelievable, it's incredible. Wow. I'd love to go. It's uh, something I think I'm sure like anybody who's watching this who's never been to a game in Mexico or Cuba as well. Like, and you tell it so well. I mean, that's the good thing about it as well. Um, I was just wondering as well. I mean, it might seem like a really obvious question, but I've never been to either Mexico or Cuba. So when you're there on match day in 
like Havana or Mexico City or anywhere else you're watching game, does it really feel like this upcoming game is the biggest show in town? Does it really feel like baseball is the thing? Oh, yeah. Absolutely. Like in, in, in Cuba, it's, you know, if, you, if you've ever been to Cuba, you're, the people in Cuba are the nicest people you ever meet. They're so kind. It's so safe being in Cuba. But the only time you'll see people in Cuba getting really, really angry and really annoyed is, is in the baseball stadium. They'll start arguing with each other and shouting at each other. And it, it get, they get very, very passionate about it. But when you know, when baseball's on, it's the whole city's on it. And it's just that night, everybody's there. I mean, the first game I went to in Havana, I was trying to meet a guy. I'd, I'd met a, a player who plays for Industriales, which is like the team that play in, in Havana. I met a guy who used to play for him, but he had an injury at the time, so he was on the IL. And he said, oh, come along tonight and, and meet me. I'll meet you in the corner of, you know, this, this square. And then I got there and there's just like thousands and thousands of people. The, the, the phone that I had, like I had a Wi-Fi card or something, but you just couldn't get on the Wi-Fi. It was just packed. Like there's people screaming. There was like some guy winding one of those air raid kind of sirens. So that's just going off in your ear and whatever. And I was just like, I'm never going to meet this guy. And sure enough, I couldn't. I mean, it was just, it was just, it's wow. just madness. It's absolute mayhem, but it's so much fun. But like it's just, um, yeah, it's well worth, well worth experiencing if you get a chance. Great. Well, hopefully we can return to this the topic of Cuba and Mexico again in the future. I'd love to sit down and have this chat again sometime. Might do with a beer or something in front of us as well. Um, just in terms of America, though, what was your favorite ballpark or favorite experience? Like, What really stands out? In, in the States, I mean, it was, again, very varied. I mean, you, you know, I, was, is it, I did a few AAA. I did one AAA, I think it was, in Albuquerque, the Isotopes, and that's got a beautiful, beautiful mountains in the background there. Um, I was at the Field of Dreams. That was forever. That'll be amazingly special. That was like I didn't. I didn't go into it thinking. I didn't think it was going to be as as amazing as it was. But it's it, again, it was an amazing place to be. Um, Camden Yards was incredible. I'd already been to PNC, the Pittsburgh Pirates, but that is that was special. Um, I mean, it's just a beautiful view of the downtown of Pittsburgh behind it. Uh, I was saying to you earlier, Fenway was was really special too because I because through a contact I, I met the grounds heads groundskeeper David Meller, who invited me in and before I knew it, I was on the infield and on the pitcher's mound pretending to draw a picture and I was uh, in the batting box and he put me in the green monster and I put my name on the wall and all this sort of stuff it was just it was, it was just but everywhere I mean Oracle San Francisco I mean it was just yeah. every, every place every stadium had its own special thing and. Um, it was it was an incredible ride. It really was. It was unbelievable. And last one on all this, then, of course, you also got to witness um, Major League Baseball in London as well. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, that was that was the so that was last year, yeah. about this time actually last year, and that was that was yeah like you know it was one of those where I, didn't, I don't think anyone really knew what to expect because they were converting the London Stadium into into a ballpark, uh, but they did a good job. It was great. Like the the atmosphere was good. Of course, the games were were quite unusual you know the first game the first inning was nearly an hour long I think or just over an hour mm. um, none of the starters I think got through the first inning I think it was the hottest day in in the UK at that point or maybe for the summer it was absolutely baking hot and I was painting and it was just I just remember it was just so, so humid um, but it was incredible I, I, I got to meet Rob Manfred very briefly and uh, I didn't you know maybe I, I, I passed on the wrong advice to him but um, but he's in a bit of trouble now um but yeah it was it was just an amazing amazing to see it in in london i mean just just amazing uh, and the, you know it was great so let's um talk about uh, painting and create then as well i guess you came over to korea for the first time to work in teaching correct 2009 same as myself yeah um that's quite a long time ago uh, but you'd had a, a background in painting before then and yeah yeah, and then yeah, I graduated from I I, I did a fine art painting at university, um, finished in two thousand and two. Did a teaching qualification, and I was teaching in the UK for five years, and then and then went over to Korea originally for three months in two thousand and nine, mm. and then it ended up being ten years as these things do. Um, not much of a planner, as you can tell. Yeah. Um, and that was that was superb. I mean, you know, I went to my first baseball stadium was um, Sajic. Uh, that was the first game I went to and you know for me I mean we're talking mostly about Jamshu I think but I was just thinking earlier like Sajik and 
and uh, Jam Shield, they really are for me. Those are the two ballparks. If you if you can get to any of those two, if you ever get to Korea or you're in Korea, those are the two for me to to be at. I always loved Mok Dong because I was always a Heroes fan. Um, so I had a special place in my heart for Mok Dong. You're the one, and, you know, you're the one Heroes fan abroad. The anyway. Kingdom, Kingdom, yeah, absolutely. Um, but yeah, I mean, but but Jamshil and Sajik, they're just phenomenal places to watch baseball. Yeah, absolutely. I agree. I agree with that. Um, were you in Korea long before you started painting the KBO ballparks? Um, no, I, I guess, you know, actually, to be fair, I, I was, what what's I've found has happened is that first of all, it was, you know, I remember being invited down to Sajik and I was meeting an American friend there and a few of us were going down and it was that thing if we got there a couple of hours early and maybe I'd do a little sketch because that was just kind of normally what I'd do. I mean, I was, I was, I was, a, te- I'm a, I was an art teacher, um, but I'd always consider myself to be an artist or, or that's just kind of always been my, my thing that I've done. So wherever I've been, I'm always just drawing, you know, s- sketching. So it started off just like that. But then after when I was, it was actually when I was up in Seoul, I probably started to watch more baseball. So I moved up to Seoul in 2012. And it was after then that I started to, to, to watch more, understand more. And then in about 2000, and, I think it was 2014, I think Joey, uh, the baseball Brit, came to our school that I worked at. And he was, we both kind of started really getting into baseball. So we went and started watching games in Jamshil and, and Mok Dong and, um, and going all around the place. And then and again, I started off and there were, there were kind of small sketches. Um, but then they just got a little bit bigger, a little bit bigger, a little bit bigger. The, the, the work that I've got from Korea, there's some of, just the sum of it is behind me. And it's mostly, as you can see, apart from the picture of Eric there, is, is Jamshil. Yeah. Um, but they, they were mostly, you know, kind of an A3 kind of size, you know, f- about 40 centimetres by about 20, 29, 30, something like that. Um, but nowadays I'm, I'm working on much, much bigger canvases and on a proper easel. These were usually done on my, on my lap in a sketchbook on paper. Um, but I've got a few canvases I did in Korea. I'm going to bring up the speaker view here so we can kind of a better look at the, the paintings behind you. So you mentioned earlier on that Sajik and Jamsha were special. I know if like certainly from atmosphere wise they are the two of the, I mean, they're the two old small parks still in, so I mean, I get out of, um, Hamba as well. Yeah, in Deja. yeah. So what makes those two particular ballparks so special? I think they've got the, uh, you see, I, I, I guess just for me, I, I always tend to like the older ballparks. Um, and I feel like with, with Jamshil and, and with Sajik, you can feel the history, you can see the history, you can almost get a sense of all the people that have been in the crowd, been in the bleachers, the cheering and the, just, just the way the game has evolved and career has evolved. And I feel like that legacy and that, that length of time is something that, that almost seeps into the concrete and the, uh, you know, the, the, actual, the actual ground itself. And I feel like that's what makes, to me, ballparks really special is that um, that collective experience we all go through and all have when we go and watch a baseball game. But also usually the fact that, that, that the experience that we're having is, you know, the modern times and the modern game. But, you know, back in 1982, there were still people there drinking cast probably and, and having a really good time and shouting a lot. So it was, it's, that, it's, that, it's, that, um, it's that legacy of it, I think. And, and I, I was, you know, the, the architecture as well of, of a ballpark, I think tells you a lot about, you know, the country's history and the country's culture or the city's history and culture. And again, you can kind of see that in Korea with, with, um, with um, Jamshil, because it was, you know, it was built in 1982. And, you know, if you, you don't need to prod around much on the internet to find out about Korea in the 80s, but it was a pretty uh, difficult time. And, and the, 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 the architecture almost quite reflects that. I feel like it's quite hard, it's quite a hard utilitarian almost looking um, ballpark and it but it, it really it kind of reflects the, the the history of that moment and that time but then you fast forward to 2016 and new um, ballpark there in Daegu and uh, the new one in uh, Masan now and you can see how our times change and how the culture's changed and the, you know the, the, the politics have changed. Yeah absolutely yeah the the evolution of the, the Korean ballpark is definitely something um, something to behold. The Guangzhou oh, yeah. one is absolutely gorgeous as well um, and even like Moonhack from 2002, it's a little bit older than some of those the newer ones, but it, it's beautiful. It's just, it's just, oh, it is. I love these ones. Oh, they are. Yeah. I mean, yeah. I mean, Korean architecture and design, they, they, they do a great job. Really great job. 
So do you want to give us a, like a tour around these pictures besides, I, lo I just love how Eric, Eric Hacker is part of this uh, interview as well. Yeah, he's critiquing them at the moment. I don't know if you know, but Eric paints as well. So he's having a little look in, but I'll, I'll, I'll tell you a bit about each one. Maybe I can maybe bring you into the camera easier or a little bit closer up so you can see more. But so this one, I'll start with this one. This one's a pinhole, pinhole photograph. So this one's taken, this one, I used to take a lot of pinhole photos. So this is just a, a box. Um, I don't know, it used to hold, I think it was like bac bacteria for the intestine or something. Wow. It holds some ginseng or something, but it's, it's little sachets of something for, for your stomach. Um, so that was a, that was a pinhole camera, camera shot. So you've got your shutter at the front here, it's just a cardboard box. But what's kind of beautiful about the shot, I'll just bring you over a bit, hopefully you better see it, is the, because it took about an hour and a half to take the photo, I don't know how clear you're going to be able to see it, but it's an exposure of an hour and a half. So the, 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 the box was sat on a chair next to me while I was painting. And you can actually see the players moving in the painting. There's these little blurs. So when, the picture on the mound, because he was always going back to the rubber, the picture on the mound is, is quite clear. You can kind of make out his shoulders and his face, because I guess there was two righties on the mound at that point. You can see the batter in the box, um, but then the shortstop, the third baseman, you can see that they're just moving just a couple of yards or a couple of meters in between things. You've got this really nice blur. So, and then the, you know, the background, the KFC, the Shinhan bank adverts and all this, they're all very nice and clear because it's nice and nice and static. So there you kind of get like, I like the fact you've got the movement of the game and the action of the game, like a still, it's, it's a still shot, but it's actually a moving image almost, which I find kind of um, quite magical really. Yeah. Uh, this one here, this was this was in spring of May 2016 or 17, I want to say. I can't remember exactly. This is actually just a print of it because the actual original is still in Seoul with a with a guy who bought the original piece. But I've always liked that piece. That was a uh, you know typical jam shield day out, and there was blossom just coming on the tree. You've got the car parking attendants here with their high vis vests on, and the the um, the bus and a few people coming in, and of course Yagu Jang. So. Again, really nice, beautiful kind of memory of, of that time there. Um, we've got a little watercolour down here from the bleachers, which was kind of where I'd sit most of the time would be out in the bleachers. There was always a, usually a little bit more room and a bit more space to set up and, and you know, just watch everything that was going on. I've got the one over here. This is from the, the outfield, but on the first base side in the right field. And again, this one I like because it's got the Jam Shield Tower. This is just as the Jam Shield Tower. No, Lotte World Ch Tower, is it? Yeah, no dear world tower, yeah. It was just as they were opening that up. So that was, that's in the background there. Um, and then down here, I've got these. These are two, two again, quite special to me. This one I really like. This is one of my favourite paintings that I've done of a ballpark anywhere out of the, the kind. I've been to nearly 90 ballparks, I think, now. and done hundreds and hundreds of paintings. So I feel, but this is one of the ones that I, I, I absolutely love. And it's just a very cute, small size. It's got the flags along the top there. It's got this kind of hazy soul atmosphere. I feel like it captured that nicely. And it's got the, the players there too. And then this one, this was this was a game in 2000 and maybe 16, I think. It was the playoffs. And I went to the playoffs to paint the ballpark, but I couldn't get in because it was it was just rammed. So I thought, what am I going to do? So I ended up walking through the ballpark away from Jamshill. And then I found myself on top of the car park. And you had this beautiful view of there's the moon there and then the glow of the lights and there was the cars and the reflection off the cars. And you just had the cheering and the the chance and all the stuff that was going in, going uh, on inside the ground. So although it was a little bit disheartening not being able to see the game and missing out on the action, it sounded like a great game, but I kind of got a nice painting out of it. So that was all right. So, so that's, that's a few of them. I mean, I've got, got lots and lots and lots of jam shield, lots and lots of career and, and plenty other places, but those are some of the, some of the, some of the good ones. I've also got, I don't know if you've got time for these, but let me see. Yeah, sure. oh, I've got these, these are the, I was doing this as well at one point. These are these are tin types. So this is a this is a photograph on a piece of aluminium, and they're called tin types. It's wet plate, wet plate collodion. It was invented in 1851, and basically you have to mix up the chemicals and you pour the chemicals onto this piece of metal, and um, and then you put it in your camera. And this this is my camera at that point. I was using one of these, which is an old press camera. This one's from 1949, but an old speed graphic, and um, you get these beautiful. Ah, they're beautiful, nice and clear, but these very unique one-off photos. Um, I've got one here also from Jam Shoe of the, one of the car parking attendants was kind of watching me. So I said, oh, can I take your photo? But to take one photo takes about 
the actual exposure time's a lot quicker than a pinhole, but just the process of developing it and the just everything it takes. I don't know. One shot will take you half an hour, and it, and it may work or it may not work exactly how you wanted it to. It's it's kind of quite sensitive, so it's quite an effort. So that's kind of where I made the shift to. Okay, I'm just going to stick with the painting um, for now, which is which is what I went for. But um, but yeah, I've got got all sorts. Brilliant, <laughs> brilliant. That was that's a really nice story. I, I agree with you as well. The, the the one on the bottom left there is the fifth one you showed us. That you said it was kind of this cute small one with the the haze. Uh, yeah. Here. Yeah, it's a great it's a great picture. The other reason why I like it is one of the things I love about Jamshill. There we go. Look at that. Um, one of the things I love about Jamshill is the, the the Gangnam skyline, the background when you're on the third base side, um, and it, it's it's definitely. I think it's the reason why I like the third base side more, especially when you're up the back, either of the outfield or the infield season, the third base side, that you have the baseball field out in front of you with the lights and the big green TV, and then you have the beautiful beautiful Gangnam skyline behind you. Oh, yeah. It's, just, it's an incredible place. Like you, Even like I was thinking earlier, the helicopters you quite often get yeah. flying over, you know, usually the anthems going, and then a, a chopper will come over the top, and it's just... Yeah, a day or an evening in Jamshire is, is not wasted. It's fantastic. Absolutely. So how long would it take to paint, um, like that, that one, one that's sitting on top of uh, Eric Hacker there? You wanted to, like, how long would it take to put that together? Um, I guess in these, when I, when I was doing these originally, I was trying to, you know, I'd turn up at the ballpark early. So I'd get there as soon as the doors were open and get in and get painting. And... Back then, it was, it was just, I was just, it was just kind of, I just started building a collection. I just became more and more of a passion and more of a, more of a thing that I wanted to do. So then I was, then I was like, I'd try and finish it before maybe the third or fourth inning. So it was probably taking a couple hours. Um, but nowadays, when I went around the States and around Mexico, then I'd be painting all through the game. I'd usually start at the beginning of the game and be painting all the way through, which the problem with that, of course, is that you don't get to watch so much of the yeah. baseball or you, you know, you're looking up and down from your canvas and over the easel and, trying to dodge foul balls so what is the plan um i know you're obviously you're selling some stuff where can where can we find your work so we have a great collection here be behind you with obviously with eric hacker too where can we find more of more of your work um I well mean, the best places i've got the a website which is andybrownstadiums.com and my Twitter, which is probably the, the social media I use the most, is at Andy B is an artist. Okay. I'm also on Instagram, that's Andy Brown is an artist. But the Twitter and my website, they've got everything on pretty much. Um, and then my plans going on from here at the moment, with the current situation, I'm not 100% sure is, is ultimately the truth. I think at the moment here, I'm in my parents, I've been locked down in my parents' house for the last three three months or so so it's back to being a teenager being grounded um so i'm i've been you know sent out to the outhouse here or the shed which i've turned into my studio and i'm doing you know pieces like this at the moment a lot these are kind of i'm doing lots of stuff to do because i can't get to the ballparks so i'm doing pieces like this which is a uh it's a dream team i've called them and it was kind of like they were actually using people on twitter followers uh, suggestions for each position in a in a baseball team so who's the best this is the yankees dream team so I put up polls on, okay, who's the best first baseman for the Yankees of all time? And, and whoever came in as top of the poll would be painted onto the canvas. So I'm doing, I'm doing things like this and I'm doing some Panini football stickers and uh, I've got a Dodgers dream team and an all-time baseball dream team. And um, yeah, I've got a whole load of, I mean, you can, I'll give you a little tour. There's that, that's, that's London 2020. That's the game that never happened. But I painted that for a podcast on last weekend. I did a big canvas of the 2020 game that, the Cardinals and the Cubs should have been playing in London. And then I've got Babe Ruth up on there on the line and a Japanese player there. Yeah, you can see there's all sorts of all sorts of stuff. So I'm surrounded. I've got Mookie Betts behind me. Uh, Michelle Platini, unfinished, but he's coming on. Gary Lineker. And then there's that's the that's the all time dream team, baseball dream team. So we've got Shooters Joe Jackson and Satchel Page and um, uh, Clemente and and all the rest of them. So it's um yeah, keeping productive. Yeah, great. Um, the Dream Team stuff looks really interesting as well. I love that Yankees one um, over to over to my left there. You you mentioned there like you got Gary Lineker and Michel Platini, and you mentioned the football Panini cards as well. So yeah. what what is it about? You kind of touched on this a little bit earlier on as well, and you're talking about Jamshel and Sajik, but 
what 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 is so special about baseball that has you drawn to uh, painting pictures of baseball ballparks more than seemingly any other sports? Um, I think it's part of the fact that I didn't I didn't know so much about it, and it was the new culture. It was the um, it's the history of it. I feel like the the fact you compare you can compare the um, the players from different generations kind of easier with baseball than maybe in most sports. But for me, it's the it's the, the finding out about the culture. It's the the finding about out about the people and and seeing people celebrating and enjoying themselves and commiserating. But the, the history of the um, of the ballpark of the city, uh, the culture of baseball, everything to do with the the actual game itself. That's my that's really what I'm interested in. I'm interested in the, the, the architecture, the music, the uniforms, just every little part that makes up, okay, this is the KBO, or this is like KBO in, in Masan, or this is KBO in Seoul, or in uh, Incheon, or whatever. So that's the, I, I want all the little bits that make up, right, this is the, I want to try and capture that feeling. Okay, when I go to the ballpark, and when I'm hearing the cheering, and, the, you know, part of the thing that I think we all love about going to a ballpark is that collective atmosphere, and that's what I want to try and capture in, um, you know that 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 thing that gets your heart and gets your gets your gets your emotions going. I want to try and capture that and and witness that and capture it in paint. Well, superb. And who? I mean, I, I think I remember this from when you were living here the last time. And I, you post a lot of your stuff on my KBO as well. I think you follow the ESPN schedule, kind of like what we're doing now. Am I right in saying that? That like whatever ESPN showing, if there's a game on the Gojek Sky Dome, then maybe that day you're kind of profiling some of your work. Yeah, no, that's that's more accidental than by by any sort of plan. But they they, they have on ESPN have shown a few of my uh, they've used it a few times over the last month or so. they or six weeks maybe. They've they've kind of used a few of these images if they're if they've got an SK game, then yeah, they'll they'll use one from Incheon or or, or something like that. But um, yeah, I'm not strategic. I'm not as uh, strategic as I should be. I'm trying to get the I'm trying to get them up on a time where I think okay, people in Korea aren't in bed yet. So that's the uh, there is that. Yeah. So who, as anybody, because I, what the thing I remember from before was you were, like you, you mentioned before that you've been in touch with people from different baseball clubs around the world. So um, a couple of famous people or a couple of well-known athletes, I guess, have picked up some of your work. Yeah. Yeah. It's been, I mean, yeah, again, that started in Korea and it was kind of why I started or why I, why I was, I guess I was quite serious about it because I was, I was going to Japan and, Tour in Japan and going to the high school tournament in Japan and over to Taiwan and I was doing that you know just 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 because I wanted to do it really just because I love the game um, but then you know I met Eric and then um, Andy Burns Xavier Scruggs uh, a few of the KBO players all of a sudden it, it was kind of all happened at the same point like the KBO players all of a sudden started to see my work and started to message me and I'd usually give them a print and they'd give me a pair of their batting gloves or a signed ball or something like that. And it's strange. That was always, that was like just a cool buzz at the time. It was kind of nice to get recognition from the guys that I, you know, I love their craft and they seem to be enjoying what I was doing. So that was always special. And then it just got bigger from there. Like um, I did a series of the winning pictures from the 2017 World Series. And uh, one of the guys who used to play for the Dodgers, Tony Watson, I did two paints of him. He won two two games pitching in that World Series and he bought those pieces so I met him in San Francisco and um, again he did us gave me a signed World Series ball for that so that was kind of cool and um, yeah it's just it's just got bigger and bigger and bigger and it's um, you know it's a real pleasure to be doing it and it's really nice to be recognized for it that's the thing where um, and it's nice to be showing these pieces because I feel like when I was originally doing the pieces well you guys were kind of interested um but the there wasn't much much knowledge of what i was doing really but nowadays i feel like i've got a much bigger following and um yeah it's a real pleasure to to have people recognize it and enjoy it and um i want to look at it and want to talk about it that's that's amazing that's that's everything to me yeah i'm sure there's somebody who's, who's watching this who's knows a lot more about this than i would for example and i'm sure they're really appreciate, appreciating all this work that you've done so um, yeah, we're like we're always happy to have you on the show as well, and hopefully we can do it again sometime, as I said, and maybe look at all of the ballparks in Korea instead of just limit, limit, uh, limiting it to um, to Jamshil. Before I let you go, um, you said you're you're back home. You're in the you know in the parents uh, the shed out the back garden there. Are yeah. there any plans to return to KBO at any point? Or I know you said you don't have any plans really, but like is it something you'd like to do? Yeah. 
Oh, I'd love to. I'd love to. You know, like we were talking before about how easy just traveling around Korea is and, and getting to the ballparks. It's it's um, I'd love to come back. Like like I said, the the you know, when I was in Mexico and, and, and in the States, the canvases were, were quite big. They were about 30 inches by about 24 inches. Um, they're pretty sizable. So I'd like to come back and, and bring my easel this time and kind of do it properly and do it, do it again. Um, because I feel like, again, like when I, when I started doing it, I didn't understand the sport. I didn't know everything that was going on. And I feel like now I understand the nuances much better. I understand the history much better. I feel like actually it's, it's, yeah, I'd love to come back and I'd love to come back to Korea and do it. It's been fantastic. Get some cash and, and some gimbap. <laughs> Get some chapji gimbap. Yeah. Yeah, or oh, Chimac. That was, that was in the Hall of Fame, I know. So that's very good, yeah. <laughs> Chimac is definitely the best thing about baseball. Uh, over here, probably. <laughs> Um, listen, uh, Annie, thanks so much for giving us a lot of your time. I know you're a busy man. You've got some other um, things going on today as well. So hopefully you do come back sometime. We'll you know, go watch a game, whatever. But in the meantime, um, all the best of that. And then we'll definitely get you back on the show maybe when Matt and the boys are around and we can you kind of like do a tour of all of your, um, your KBO ballpark so far. Absolutely. Any, any time. Thanks very much for having me. It's been great to, great to talk to you again. No problem. Thanks very much. And that's it. That's our show done for this midweek. It's our Jamshul uh, preview of Doosan Bears versus LG Twins. Um, enjoy those games. It should be crackers if we're going to watch them on ESPN or on Spoke TV here in Korea. Um, second versus third in the current standings in the Korean Baseball League. It's going to be a great series. We hope you enjoy it all. Um, again, a big, big thank you to Andy Brown and Danny Kurtz for coming on and talking to me on the show today. As I said, Matthew, Brad and Brad should be back for the Sunday night, the regular Sunday night slot. Thank you again so much for watching the show. And remember, you can be a friend of our show at uh, Grand Slam KBR at Chimac Baseball. We'll talk to you on Sunday night. Have a great day. Have a great weekend. Bye-bye.